Hello, Podwalkers, and welcome to another episode of Goblin Lore. I'm your host, Joe Redeman. You can find me on Twitter at Lorthos. That's L-O-R-E-T-H-O-S. Now, I'm doing a solo episode today. This is going to be a small Goblin Games episode about swearing. That's right. We are talking about cursing, uh, profanity, and I am fascinated by this because I am very interested in linguistics, especially in linguistics when it comes to uh, fantasy properties. So linguistics is the study of language and how we use it and how it's developed over time. And to me, swearing is a really fascinating component of linguistics because it reveals a lot about where a culture came from uh, linguistically, where its where its roots uh, are, but also because it shows something about the religious beliefs of a culture or a language. It shows something about the uh, tolerance of the levels of profanity, whether or not really, we'll say, coarser swears develop and become prolific, or smaller, you know, more tame oaths uh, are the profanity of choice, are the are the coarse language of choice. So to me, this is really fascinating because in Magic the Gathering, we have innumerable worlds and countless cultures and societies on those planes that each of them has developed some sort of linguistic quirks, these these idiosyncrasies that are part of people's day-to-day lives, and especially for the main characters that we follow that put themselves in extremely stressful situations day after day, there's going to be a curse word dropped here or there. And so I am really fascinated by this, uh, and, and I realized that uh, after doing some research, uh, Doug Beyer actually wrote one of his Savor the Flavor articles back in 2008 on cursing and swearing. And so I think it's really cool to, to talk about this. And I won't I won't be dropping a ton of F-bombs all over the place here. Um, you know, we're going to keep we're going to keep that non-explicit rating. Um, but I uh, I do. I do understand, you know, there are might be some people who try to avoid swearing for themselves. You try to avoid hearing it. So don't worry. We're talking about this uh, as academically as possible. Um, first, I wanted to start with, I guess, a little bit of a history of swearing and curse words in, uh, in the real world. Um, so profanity just means it's a word rooted in the word profane, which is the opposite of sacred. So it is taking something, say, holy, uh, and removing the reverence or adding disrespect to it. it. Originally, profane came from classical Latin profanus, literally meaning outside the temple. So again, outside of the realm of the holiness. And uh, we have really, English is very good at picking up lots of bits of other languages. And especially when it comes to curse words, we have taken quite a few of them on from different languages. In English, though, we tend to, our swear words have tended to be Germanic in origin. So coming from the root of of languages, including German, Danish, Dutch, um, even once you go further back, Swedish uh, and Norwegian, all of those, that root of family trees, that that branch of the family tree of the Indo-European languages is where we get our uh, swear words from. So S-H-I-T, that word, and F-U-C-K, the F word, also both come from a Germanic root. There's actually a German word, a German verb, uh, coarsely, that means the same thing as the F word, which is pretty great. Um so really, really easy cognate uh, to say the German version of that, and I and I really appreciate it. Uh, the alternatives that come from Latin tend to be much more um, medical or technical in origin. They tend to be seen as more high language and less as vulgarity. 
and again, vulgarity tends to mean something base, something lower. Uh, and so that's the opposite there of, of high language. Um, so in the case of the S word, uh, the Latin versions would be defecate or excrete. And so, you know, those are much more technical terms. Those are things you might hear your doctor say. You will not hear your doctor say, ah, yes, that is a rough S word. Um, the Latin versions of F would be fornicate or copulate. Uh, fornicate does come from the same Indo-European root word as the F word, but going through Latin on its way to English, you know, again, we hold it in that same sort of uh, medical, technical, um, high language position. So um, the profanity that that we use uh, for this reason is sometimes referred to as Anglo-Saxon. Uh, you know, you, you speak in Anglo-Saxon because our language derived from Anglo-Saxon uh, melding of, of languages. And, and so there's that that common commonality there. So it's interesting to think that, you know, many of our common day curse words, uh, you know, and often a complaint about cursing is that it has made language dirty and base and simple and unintelligent. And it's just, you know, ruining it today because of all the kids cursing all, you know, all over the place. And I think there's some element to that in the sense that many sort of the progression of society today is not nearly as the, the boundaries between um, between formal company and casual company with with in terms of the person, the people you're around, those lines have sort of tended to blend and blur a little bit more today. And I do think that the younger generation has a little bit less concern for um, for upholding some of the older, more formal um, formalities. And that's fine. That's just a difference in society. That's not a bad thing. That's not a value judgment on my part. It's just a, this is how our culture is progressing a little bit. Um, but it's not as if we have just taken these vulgar words and crammed them into our language in the last 50 years and all of a sudden, you know, now everyone's just cursing. These these words have been around for a long time, even in English alone. And so looking back just in English, even though there are even older Germanic and Scandinavian language roots, uh, the uh, just a couple of these, this comes from an article by NewRepublic.com. The F word uh, doesn't seem to have existed in, in English before the 15th century. Um, but there are some instances of Old English and German and Dutch using it at least as early as the late 1280s, 1290s, that range. Um, there are some examples of it being used in place names in England in the late 1280s as well. You know, again, in that time where the Angles and the Saxons were melding and their cultures were blending. Uh, there are some examples of it in uh, in Sher near Sherwood, England uh, in 1287 is one of the earliest dates that have been found. So uh, the F word, at least 800 700 years old. The S word. The S word has a very rich history as well across both German and Scandinavian languages. Uh, originally, all of these actually meant they were the technical words because we didn't have the Latin cognates. Uh, and so this word m meant excrement. Uh, and so uh, it especially meant cattle excrement and Cattle in farming land, you know, have a lot of excrement, especially in places where they might um, do their business into a stream or a brook. And so um, now today, the town of Skidbrook in Lincolnshire, England, literally means S-Stream. And that place name was found in the Domesday book, the famous 
piece of uh, land property, liability, bookkeeping essentially from 1086, just after the Norman conquest of England. So the word S, at least a thousand years old. Then we get to uh, perhaps an, a favorite one of our friends across the pond in England, Ireland, and even also in Australia, um, the C word. And uh, interestingly, C uh, is etym etymologically, so meaning its roots in the language, it's more feminist than vagina, the you know term for the female reproductive organ, which is... Uh, Vagina is dependent on the penis for definition because that word means, is, is from Latin originally for sword sheath, whereas C just refers to the body part. So that's an interesting little element to me. But interestingly, comes all the way back, this C word goes all the way back, at least in English, to 1275 in Kent in England, where there is a... Uh, an area, a narrow wooded area in a valley uh, called something along these lines, uh, essentially what would translate to a literal lady garden. So there's that for you. I, th I think this stuff is fascinating because it just shows that these words do have a root. And frankly, none of them were coarse back in the day, but... Once Latin comes in and culturally becomes a more scientific and accepted high language than Anglo-Saxon, these words then become vulgar versions of the descriptions. And obviously, the things that they're describing, we don't tend to talk about with strangers or, uh, you know, in public, looks directly down the barrel of the camera of this podcast. But, you know, once... Once these are more private conversations and these words become seen as less than the highest form of communication about these concepts, then they, they pass into what we'd call vulgarity. And so uh, this, is, this is a really fascinating uh, sort of circumstances to me. Also because when we get into, when we look at sort of the the proliferation of them, uh, an analysis of recorded conversations has revealed that roughly 80 to 90 words per day, or about 0.5% of your words in a day, are swear words. Now, that'll vary somewhat. You know, the high end maybe will be 0%. Or that'll be the, you know, absolute uh, sorry, the low end will be 0%, the absolute minimum that someone speaks a swear word, obviously. But, eh, you know, you can swing up to like 4%. So, depends on, on who you are, where you work, your socioeconomic status. Again, because there is that, that class status in here. But I just think it's interesting that 0.5% of the words we use in a day, on average, are swear words. Whereas, first person prone, plural pronouns, we, us, and our, are only 1%. So, you know... Half of the times that you say we, us, or our in a day, you're swearing. Just think about that. It's interesting, too, that swearing performs certain psychological functions. It uses uh, uses this, this... It's not just for the sake of being coarse. It perhaps will serve to uh, release anger, give relief. It can just be an expression of pain if you stub your toe or something. It's just very interesting. There are sociolinguistic functions for psychological functions that swearing serves that other words just simply don't get across for some reason. There's something within us, sort of a, a again, this is the, the difference between the, the base and the elevated, but there's something primal within us that when we have a, you know, a painful moment we'll we'll swear when we have an angry moment we'll swear and some of those those are some of the earliest emotional uh states that our bodies and minds were able to really understand um and so taking all of this from the real world and looking at magic the gathering 
For things like the Gate Watcher, our planeswalkers, we have bouncing from world to world, saving people, putting themselves in danger. They're they are constantly existing in high stress situations. They are constantly inflicting pain on others and pain having pain inflicted on themselves. And it's reasonable to think that they're going to swear. Uh, think too about the socioeconomic class divide in language that happens. Sure, you will have many of the educated folks. You'll have your grand arbiter, Augustine the Fourths, saying, uh, you know, <laughs> prosecuting a case in Azorius court about the um, proliferation of excrement on Tin Street. And that is not a course turn a phrase but i doubt you're gonna hear him say what a load of you know that's just not gonna happen so again this is this is sort of the the difference where our gatewatch don't tend to come from these higher echelons of of uh, the socioeconomic strata they will probably be dropping a few curse words i doubt you'd maybe hear somebody like ugin uh or soren dropping curse words because they are more nobility or, or, you know, sort of higher up on the, um, the social totem pole. Um, but you do have this element where, uh, you know, the common folk of, of Tin Street and Ravnica, the, the guildless people just going about their day-to-day -day lives, they're probably dropping a few curse words here and there just because it's part of their language. It's a very interesting concept to me, especially, too, when you look at... Uh, I, I actually borrowed the Magic the Gathering complete collection of uh, Dak Faden comics from a uh, good friend of the podcast, Vorthos Mike Lineman. And on page two, you have Dak Faden running away from a Rakdos demon who's blasting fire after him. There's a couple of Rakdos thrill killers chasing him. He's stolen something. And you see him in high stress, and one of the speech bubbles says, Damn, damn, damn. Page three at the bottom, he gets to a locked door that he can't get through, and it says S hashtag percentage T exclamation point. So very clearly, Dak Faden is aware of these um, these, these curse words, you know, there is a, there is some evidence of cursing in the magic multiverse. And so also coming back to Doug Byers, Savor the flavor article, Doug identifies a couple of different ways to handle cursing in a fantasy property or a sci-fi property. Um, the basic one is that while all of these characters are probably speaking their own native local languages, you know, which are very different from English or French or German or Spanish or whatever. They are, they're not speaking that way in the novels or in the comic books because we are the readers. And obviously, you know, this, this is the very meta thing of like, we can't understand what modern Ravnican sounds like or looks like or reads like. And so you know, of course, these comics have to be written in English or whatever your local language is. But the other thing is uh, the writers simply don't most of the time have time to create a language for this. J.R.R. Tolkien did create languages for the entire Lord of the Rings series. Obviously, this was one of the main reasons that he wrote the whole uh, the whole series uh, was delving into linguistics and seeing how to make a world rich with history and um, with it, well, language that has evolved uh, over, over time, quote unquote. Um, this is what is called a constructed language or a conlang. Um, specifically, J.R.R. Tolkien did that with Elvish, Dwarvish, I believe as well. And I can't remember if there was another one, but a lot of that was very it, it was an experiment in how to make internally consistent fake language grammar and conjugation and, and all this sort of stuff. And it's, it's a beautiful thing, but for a property like magic, the gathering, which focuses on the card game and not the stories are an element of it, but it is not the main focus of wizards 
and, and what they're doing, creating a multitude of conlangs is not the most efficient way to go about world building. It's just, there's just simply no time before the story has to go out. So that's one element of this that is interesting is, is their deck is probably swearing in a Fioran uh, version of the S word and damn, but we obviously wouldn't be able to understand that. And so probably that's why it's not in there. A couple of these ways that Doug does identify that uh, fantasy and sci-fi properties will use swears is elevated language. So it sounds old timey. Um, so think of Anchorman and Ron Burgundy when he goes, great Odin's Raven. That's, that's a version of elevated language. You know, it sounds very, it, it's a longer sort of phrase or, um, you know, something, something just sounding sort of stiff and stale. Uh, maybe your paladins use this a little more than, than something else, uh, you know, than the average, uh, goblin, um, these and thous can be there. And, uh, it's interesting too, that I, I learned something from Doug's article here, which, uh, the old curse, uh, zounds, Z O U N D S, uh, does have an origin in earth religion in, in Christianity and God, which means God's wounds. That's just bonkers to me. Um, so, you know, this is interesting because the magic multiverse doesn't have earth religions, obviously, but that does mean that very, a uh, very many of the odes and, and profanity that we would use, uh, kind of go out the window for magic. You can't say, Oh my God, or, Jeez, because that comes from Jesus. Gosh, even is a is a mild oath that comes from God. Uh, but you know, saying like "Oh my Lord," "Oh my word," this sort of stuff coming out of the mouth of a Ravnican citizen just wouldn't make any sense. To hear Baron Singer go, "Oh my stars and garters," you just might be like, "Eh, I don't, I don't really know about that one, guy." So. Uh, that said, though, a lot of these elevated language swears do come from religions originally. So perhaps on Dominaria, there is a swear um, related to, you know, by like maybe it's by Gaia, you know, by Gaia or something like that. Um, maybe there is one cursing Yogmoth. And so uh, Doug suggests yog off which is really fascinating to me i like that one a lot um you know there are uh ramadaragas the the ancient dragon the primeval uh dragon on dominaria that maybe there's something in there uh you think of i, I doubt the selesnia are the ones cursing on ravnica but perhaps there is something uh relating to mat selesnia the world soul um there's there's plenty of material for sort of this pulling from elevated language uh, uh, kind of swear word that I think is there. It's just the easy stuff doesn't really work. So then there's the made up swear. So usually this will take a uh, swear word that does exist in modern day English, for instance, or, or a different language and substitute some letters or sounds into it. So it is not exactly the curse word. So think of Battlestar Galactica with frack instead of the F word. Um, frick is a little bit that already anyways in, in modern English um, or fudge, you know? Uh, so some of this sounds kind of the, the big concern with this one is it can sound kind of corny, kind of hokey. And um, I, I just, yeah, having uh, the Boros interviewing, you know, interrogating Krenko and and uh, Krenko going, I don't know what the frick you're talking about. Just sort of sounds like a fifth grader wrote that dialogue. Um, so that's one of the concerns with this with this one is it, we can really diminish the height of the dramatic dialogue in the middle of the story uh, when when one of these comes along. Um, so this is one that maybe gets used less, but I think it's, I do think it's interesting. You can always use real world cusses. That's the third version, the third, uh, category. Um, it really 
depends though. Uh, there's a lot of weight that real words carry with them. Uh, and you know, a lot of real world etymology that goes into them, like we we're talking about with the elevated language too. And so this one is, is tough to employ well on top of the fact that in a PG property like magic, you don't tend to get to use them that much. Um, so this is one that really can be, uh, be tough to employ properly. Um, you have narrative evasion. I like this one a lot. This is cool. So you remove the quotation marks, you drop out of the quotation marks for a while and let the reader fill in whatever it is that they think the character is saying. For instance, this is the example that Doug gives. Garrick unleashed a stampede of profanities that trampled all sensibilities within earshot. And that's kind of cool because it then leaves everything up to the reader's imagination. I mean, and maybe maybe for you, what you imagine Garrick cursing as is just a stream of roaring beast-like sounds. I don't know. Like, that might be how he curses, but it's up to you to decide. That's what I hear in my head, but maybe for you it's, you know, it's frack or whatever. Uh, and so that's really, really fascinating to me. Um, and then there's the absence approach, just not swearing at all. And that can work for certain characters. I think it works in certain contexts, but I do think it's interesting how much of our, we talked before about the percentage of our daily lives that are swears and i think it's you know it's avoiding something that would be a common part of day-to-day -day linguistics in the multiverse um you know if, if you were to go completely without swears across the entirety of it without any sort of oaths or vulgarity or or anything like that i think you're diminishing the reality of the story because there's something again there is something that connects us about these swears, these curses, um, th that makes you feel human. It's a base human feeling of pain that, that, you know, when you stub your toe and you hear someone mutter a swear, you're like, yeah, yeah, I've been there. I feel you. You know, you ask, are you okay? Like, um, <laughs> just, just these, these sort of things are, are, I think, really, truly uh, a part of the human condition. And I think avoiding them altogether is, is just kind of, it's not there. It's not exactly right. So I, uh, I wanted to end this episode with uh, a little bit of a travel down the curse words that we do know in magic lore, specifically from the flavor text of cards. So the first one that we find is uh, from the card Ether Snap. And that flavor text says, quote, may you wake to find you were only ever a dream, a Mephidros curse. Again, that's an example of that heightened language, that elevated sort of language where it's a, a longer phrase. It feels a little bit more, um, a little bit more stilted to use, but that's a good one. It's a good one. May you wake to find you never actually existed. Uh, another, this would be on Curse of Death's Hold. May you and all your kin waste and wither until your clan is no more. It's good. It's good. That, that's got some weight to it. Uh, on Curse of the Pierced Heart, may your veins weep and may every vampire take notice. That is a curse in Stenzia uh, on Innistrad. Not a, uh, not a great place. Uh, curse of Thirst, may you drink until you drown but never be sated. That comes to us from Odala, Witch of Morkrit. On Goblin Swine Rider, may you get the mount you deserve. That's a curse in Sukata, um, one of the towns, one of the areas in uh, Jamura uh, from Visions and Mirage. Uh, on Kervex Hex, if this does not strike you dead, question your soul. Pretty good. Pretty good. On Nizumi Shadow Watcher, uh, this is from Betrayers of Kamigawa, uh, the... Flavor text says, the Okiba gang, night cursed thieves and assassins. So that's an interesting one where it clearly indicates that night is, is the thing doing the cursing. Um, so there's this, this sort of association with night and the evils it brings and, and that being accursed. 
on Urborg Stalker. May you be a stalker's dream. That's an Urborg curse, obviously. And I guess we'll end it with this one. The on Taunting Elf from Urza's Destiny. Uh, Urza's, yes, from Urza's Destiny. The flavor text says, Much to Multani's chagrin, Raffellos gleefully tutored y Yavamaya's elves on the rudest and most vulgar words spoken in Lanowar. So that we have a perfect example of the, um, the narrative evasion, the replacement. You get to figure out what it was that Raffellos taught all of Multani's elves. So thank you all for journeying with me for a little bit on this uh, exploration of swearing in the multiverse. I'm planning to write an article on this later on, on goblinlore.home.blog. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll poke around a little bit more and into the novels for a little more in-depth exploration of some of these words and phrases. But I just think this is a really interesting thing um, because it shows a lot about the languages that magic employs. It, it really reveals that there are elements of magic that feel very real to us. And I think that is one of the most powerful parts of, of why magic resonates with us and has done so for more than 25 years now. Its language reflects ours, and that feels like home. That's our show. You can find the podcast at Goblin Lore Pod on Twitter or email any questions, comments, or concerns to goblinlorepodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the friendly neighborhood gobslugs, you can do so at patreon.com slash goblinlorepod. This episode of Goblin Lore was hosted by Alex Newman, who you can find on Twitter at Alexander New M. Engineering, editing, and production for this episode by Joe Redman, who you can find on Twitter at Findhorn. That's F Y N D Horn. Our music is by Wintergott, who you can find at Wintergotten.com. That's Winter G A T A N.com. Logo by Stephen Raphael on Twitter at Stephen Raffel. Goblin Lore is a presentation of Hipsters of the Coast, which you can find at hipstersofthecoast.com or at hipstersmtg on Twitter. Thank you all for listening, and remember, goblins, like snowflakes, are only dangerous in numbers. 